morning. I want to welcome you this morning to Berean Bible Church. I want to do something a little bit different today. I want to use a text of Scripture to try to deal with a political situation that we're facing. Okay? Here in Virginia, you know, we are coming under attack by our governor uh, who is threatening to take away our guns, threatening to do confiscation, threatening all kinds of stuff. So I, I want to bring in a passage of Scripture that I think will really help us uh, clarify this whole thing. Now, I need to begin this morning by saying something that I say all the time, but something you need to particularly hear in our study this morning. You, all of you, every one of you, are called to be Bereans. Okay? Acts 17, 10, and 11 says, The brothers immediately sent Paul and Silas away to, by night to Berea. Berea was a city. He said, And when they arrived, they went into the Jewish synagogue. Now these Jews, the Jews at Berea, were more noble than those in Thessalonica. They received the word with all eagerness, examining the Scriptures daily to see if these things were so. So being a Berean means that you don't believe anything that you hear, anything that you hear, without studying it out for yourself. I don't care how good it sounds, how bad it sounds, don't accept it, don't reject it without study, without digging in and seeing what it says. I am not asking you to believe what I'm telling you this morning. I'm asking you to study it. If what I'm saying, you study it out and it makes sense, then believe it. Okay, buy it. If it doesn't, discard it and come and tell me what you saw that I'm missing. Okay, so I can uh, be on track there also. For our study this morning, I want to look at the subject of, as Americans, who must we submit to? The Bible calls for submission. Submission is important. But we have 10 zillion rules in our society. What do we have to submit to? Who do we have to submit to? Now, to answer this question... Many people would point to Romans 13, the text that Gary wrote, and they tell us that we have to submit to civil authorities, all the, all the rules they put out, everything they say, we have to submit to that. Well, Romans 13 is a problematic text, okay? It's not, you know, people just read it and they say, oh, this is simple, we know what this says. One writer says this of it, these seven verses have caused more unhappiness and misery in the Christian East and West than any other seven verses in the New Testament. I don't know if that's true, but you get the point, right? This is a difficult text. Others have so struggled with what seems to be the overwhelming absolutes in this text that they say, well, this is not Pauline. Okay, this is an interpolation that was added later, so we can just ignore this. See, people see the difficulty here, so that's how they deal with it. Let's just, let's just ignore it. Paul didn't write it. It's somebody else. But the majority of Christians believe that this text is calling for submission to the state of Rome, and thus calling for Christians to submit to all civil government. Bob Deffenbaugh writes this, There is no reason for the Christian to fear government. Not sure where he lives. Yeah, I do know where he lives. He's an American. <laughs> fear government for its purpose is to punish evildoers and reward those who do good. Since the Christian is to practice what is good and avoid evil, there should be no conflict between the Christian and government. And my response to that is, are you serious? We are continually in conflict with a government that is devoid of any spiritual values. Constantly in conflict with that. I mean, our government thinks it's okay to kill babies. Uh, hopefully we're in conflict over that. Today people don't know who's a man and who's a woman. W you know, we got to be in conflict with our government and the things they're pushing down our throat now. Well, the view that this applies to our civil government is reinforced by some translations of the Bible. For example, the Good News Bible says this, everyone must obey the state authorities. I don't know where they got that. They just, you know... Some Bibles have subheadings for each chapter. One of them, at Romans 13, says this, Submission to the state. Another says, Be subject to government. 
Now those words, they're not part of Scripture, but they're in the Bible, so people say, hey, I must be right. We have to submit to the state. They're just someone's opinion of what Romans 13 says. But does it? I don't think so. Hopefully you figure that out by now. Okay? I don't think so. And one of the main reasons that I don't is the context. Okay, we've gone over and over. Context is king. You understand that, right? We have to see what is the context of verses. Well, the surrounding context of these seven verses, before them, after them, is about love. All right? Well, does Paul then just inject seven verses on submission to civil government? Talking about love. By the way, obey the government. Back to love again. Does that make any sense? It doesn't to me. Well, there's another view out there that's the view held by some Christians that say that this text is referring to leaders in the church. Do church leaders have the power of the sword? I don't think so. I see no indication in Scripture that this is calling or talking about church leaders. Do church leaders collect taxes? Some try to. <laughs> I don't see this text talking about church leaders. I think that's a pretty you know, weak view here of these. Now, there are some preterists who believe that this text is calling for the transition saints to submit to the government of Rome until the return of Christ. Then Rome's authority is crushed and the believer is under King Yeshua only. And they use verses like 1 Corinthians 15, 24. Then comes the end, when He delivers the kingdom of God, the Father, after destroying every rule and every authority and power. So if all rule, authority, and power are abolished, then they assume that there's no authorities over the Christians. Well, the next verse helps us understand what this text is talking about. It says, For he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. From this verse, we see that the rule, authority, and power that are abolished are those of his enemies, the enemies of Christ. This is not saying that after the second coming, the Christian only authority is Christ. There's still authority and submission in the kingdom of God. Now their position would be that this text does not apply to us. It only applied to the transition saints. I would agree with them on that. That this text only applies to the transition saints. I don't think it applies to us. But I don't think Paul was calling the transition saints to obey Rome. Again, that doesn't fit the context. All right, then there's the position that I hold, which is that Romans 13, 1 through 7, is referring to the synagogue rulers in Rome. This position is put forth by Mark Nanos in his book, The Mystery of Romans. I think that in order to understand Romans 12 through 15, we need to have an understanding of the Jewish synagogue in Rome. See, by the time of Christ, it was the synagogue, not the temple, that was the central institution for Jewish worship. And that makes sense because even the Jews living in Israel would go to Jerusalem three times a year. Only, that's all they had to do, but some of them only went once a year. But they went to the synagogue every Sabbath. Every week they'd go to the synagogue. And when you think about the church in Rome, what comes to your mind? You think of them meeting like in a church building similar to our churches today? I want to suggest to you that Rome, the church in Rome, met in the synagogue. Both Jews and Gentiles, they met in the synagogue to worship Yahweh. When Saul was persecuting Christians, where did he find them? He went to the synagogues. All right? He didn't go to the local churches. It wasn't a local church. He went to the synagogue. He found them in the synagogue, Acts 9, 1 and 2. The Jews who believed in Yeshua would go to the synagogue on the Sabbath, just as they had always done, and the believing Gentiles would join them. And evidence indi indicates that in Rome, Christianity and Judaism shared a common heritage and were probably inseparable before AD 60, and even perhaps until the middle of the second century. Robert Goldenberg asserts that it is in increasingly accepted among scholars that at the end of the first century CE, there were not yet two separate religions called Judaism and Christianity. Outside the synagogue environment, the early Christians would have had little opportunity to learn the Scriptures. Where were the Scriptures? They were in the synagogue. Okay, they wanted to study, they'd go there. Now in Rome, 
Jews and Gentiles are meeting in the synagogue, and the Gentile believers were being tempted to look down on the unbelieving Jews. See, they viewed them as excluded from God's purpose. The Gentile believers were beginning to look at the unbelieving Jews in the synagogue with disdain because they had rejected and crucified the Messiah. In chapters 12 through 15, it seems that Paul is specifically addressing the Gentile believers. He wants them to treat the non-believing Jews in the synagogue with love that they may be one to Christ. That's what he deals with in chapter 11. Now, nothing in chapter 12 or 13 supports the idea that Paul has switched his focus in chapter 13 to discuss the Christian's relationship to civil government. As I said, this doesn't fit in the context at all. Chapter 13 begins by what has traditionally been regarded as an abrupt transition because it lacks either conjunction or joining particle and has a change to a third person. So Paul wrote this as though there was no major transition. He just isn't shifting. He's still talking about love. What he was talking about in chapter 12. And the thematic link between 13, 1 through 7 and its surrounding verses is important also. For example, the words evil, good, wrath, and vengeance appear in these seven verses and in the surrounding context of 12, 9 through 21 and 13, 8 through 10. In 12, 9 through 21, he's talking about love, loving each other, loving enemies. And then in 13, 8, he's right back to talking about love and the law of God. And I think that 13, 1 through 7 is still talking about the Christian Gentiles' need to love the stumbling. By that, those Jews that have not yet trusted Messiah. Those who they associate with in the synagogue, particularly the unsaved Jews that are rulers in the synagogue. They must love and submit to them even though they may view them as their enemies. That puts the whole context about love. So in 13, 1-7, the issue is still love. And that really fits well with the context. Paul is calling for love and unity in the synagogue for the sake of the elect Jews that have not yet come to Christ. He's calling on the Gentile believers to be good witnesses to his unsaved brothers that they may be one to Christ. Now, I would encourage you, I'm not going to go into a whole lot of depth in exegeting these verses on the area of the synagogue rulers and stuff, so I would encourage you, if you want to know more, go to Romans, go to our study online, go to Romans 13. I did two messages on this on Romans 13, and you'll get more detail in my defense of why this is a synagogue. But I want, like I said, I, I have a particular agenda for these verses this morning that I want you to see. Um, Romans 13.1 says, Let every person be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God. Those that exist have been instituted by God. Commenting on this verse, Tom Holland writes this. He says, Recently, an alternative understanding of authority, authorities in Romans 13 has been put forward. It is argued that local churches did not always separate from the local synagogues, perhaps because they afforded protection to the believers, and that this was the situation in Rome. This historical setting has been used to argue that the governing authorities of verse 1 are not representatives of the Roman state, but of the synagogue. This recently argued understanding has Paul pleading for the Gentile believers to accept the authority of the Jewish leadership of the synagogue because God has appointed it. And that's what I'm arguing. That's my position here. Now he says, let every soul. This is the Greek pas suke, which means all life. So what he is saying is, listen, Jews, Gentiles, all of you. Be subject to the governing authorities. Be subject. This is the Greek word, hupotasso. We know that word, right? It's a military term. It means to line up to take your orders. You line up under authority, you take your orders. It's in the pres present imperative middle, which means to habitually be in subjection to the governing authorities. This comes from Huparecho, which means to be above, superior, and the word authorities is the Greek word exousia, which means power, authority, privilege. So everyone is to submit to those in authority, he's saying. Why? He tells us. 
He says, for there is no authority except from God. For gives us the reason for the submission. This is why you submit to these authorities, because there is no authority but God. Now, as I said, most people see this as speaking of civil government. I don't. But the principle is universal. All human authority is delegated and ministerial. This includes authorities of parents, employers, policemen, teachers, church leaders, or any other authority. Anyone who is in a place of authority has had it delegated to them by God, the sovereign Lord who decrees every event in time and put in place all authority. Let's look at a few verses that make this really clear about God setting up authorities. Daniel 2, 20 and 21 says, Daniel answered and said, Blessed be the name of God forever and ever, to whom belong wisdom and might. He changes times and seasons, He removes kings, and He sets up kings. That would be a good thing for us to remember. They get in there, they get in power by God, who puts them in power. He gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to those who have understanding. So Yahweh sets up and removes kings. Daniel 2.37, You, O king, the king of kings, to whom the God of heaven has given the kingdom. Again, he's stressing you're in this position because God put you there. All right? Daniel 4.17, This sentence is by the decree of the watchers, the decision by the word of the holy ones, to the end that the living may know that the most high rules in the kingdom of men and gives it to whom he will it ends by saying he sets over at the lowliest of men. We understand that, right? <laughs> you know, sometimes you're saying, how can that person be a ruler? All right? But God gives it to whom he will. Yahweh rules over mankind. He sets up its rulers. Daniel 4.25 says that you shall be driven from among men. He's talking to um, Nebuchadnezzar here. And your dwelling shall be with the beasts of the field. You shall be made to eat grass like an ox. You shall be wet with the dew of heaven. And seven periods of time shall pass over you until you know that the Most High rules over the kingdom of men and gives it whom He will. So Daniel's stressing this, the sovereignty of God. Look at verse 35. All the inhabitants of the earth are counted as nothing. And He does according to His will among the hosts of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth. And no one can stay His hand or say to him, what have you done? All right, He does according to His will. God does according to His will among the inhabitants of the earth. So what he's saying here is Yahweh's will is never frustrated. God never says, oh, how'd they ever get elected? He does as He pleases. He sets up godly and ungodly men to serve His purpose. Look what Jeremiah says, Jeremiah 27, 5-8. It is I who by my great power and my outstretched arm have made the earth with the men and animals that are on the earth, and I give it to whomever it seems right to me. So God is saying, I'm in control. I give in charge who I want to. Now I have given all these lands into the hand of Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, my servant. So here he calls a pagan king my servant. I put all these lands under Nebuchadnezzar's control, I did that. He's my servant. I have given him also the beasts of the field to serve him. All the nations shall serve him and his son and his grandsons until the time of his own land comes. Then many nations and great kings shall make him their slave. But if any nation or kingdom will not serve this Nebuchadnezzar, this pagan king that God set up, if they won't serve him, the king of Babylon, and put its neck under the yoke of the king of Babylon, I will punish that nation with the sword, with famine, with pestilence, declares Yahweh, until I have consumed it by my hand. So God says, I set him up, and if you don't submit to him, I'll hold you accountable. So all authorities, listen, good and bad, are put in place by the sovereign Yahweh, and we are called to submit to them. Isaiah 45, 1-4. through Thus says Yahweh to his anointed Cyrus, another pagan king that God calls his anointed, whose right hand I have grasped to subdue nations before him and to loose the belts of kings, 
to open doors before him that gates may not be closed. I will go before you and leave the exalted places. I will break in pieces the doors of bronze and cut through the bars of iron. All right? He, said, he continues, I will give you the treasure of darkness and the hordes and secret places that you may know that it is I, Yahweh, the God of Israel, who call you by name. Talking to Cyrus, I call you by name. For the sake of my servant Jacob and Israel, my chosen, I call you by your name, a name I name you, though you do not know me. So we see that there is no authority except from God, and those that exist have been instituted by God. Now, now that we got that, right? God sets up kings. He takes down kings. He is the one putting people in authority. Now that we understand that, let's talk about authority and submission. That's almost like dirty words today, you know? Submission, authority. Just because someone's in authority over us doesn't mean they're better than us, right? All you women should be saying, amen. Okay? <laughs> or you're not paying attention. Let me say that again. Just because someone is in authority over us doesn't mean they're better than us. <laughs> or smarter than us. Or more qualified than us. Subordination involves no degradation. A person is not dishonored by being subject to someone else. Let me prove that to you. 1 Corinthians 11.3 But I want you to understand that the head of every man is Christ. We should all understand that, right? Christ is our head. We are, we are to submit to Christ. The word head here is from the Greek word kaphale, and it means government or authority. Christ is our authority. He's our head. Oh, here's where the problem comes. The head of every wife is her husband. I'm sure there's got to be modern translations that have taken this verse out, okay? I mean, this is hard for people to swallow today. They don't, they don't see this at all. There's no difference between men and women. Listen, this is the Bible, and this is what it says. The head of the wife is her husband. Whether the wife likes it or not, every time I do a wedding service, I stress the fact that the wife's role is to submit to the husband. And always, someone comes up to me afterwards. Good service, but I don't know about that part about submission. I didn't make it up. Okay, it's in the Bible. Go read it for yourself. I didn't make that up. But people don't like that. All right? Well, look what it says. And the head of Christ is God. Authority and subjection have nothing to do with essence. It strictly deals with function. In essence and nature, Christ and Yahweh are equal. But by Yahweh's design, the function of the Son demanded that He submit to the Father in a beautiful act of humiliation. In marriage, for the sake of function, the woman is to take the place of submission. Not when she agrees with her husband, not when she likes what he says, always. Okay? <laughs> the man doesn't have to be smarter. He doesn't have to be, make better sense to be an authority. We all know he usually isn't, okay? It's just how God set it up. He's an authority in the home because God made him the authority in the home. There's no dishonor for a woman to be in subjection to the man. Now, in government, why do we have to submit to those in authority? Because they're better than everybody else? Uh, not even close, okay? Most of them are a bunch of lying, thieving hypocrites, okay? Sorry to say that, but that's just how it is, okay? There has to be authority and submission, though, or there, your, choice, your other choice is anarchy. And no so society can survive anarchy. Everyone does what is right in their own mind. And it's the wild, wild west all over again. All right, in the church, God has called pastors or elders to lead and the people to submit to the leadership. This is not because the elders are better or more spiritual than anybody else. We're all equal in Christ. There's no clergy-lady division in the church. The pastors are leaders among equals. The pastors are an authority simply because God has called them to lead. It's a matter of function. Now, I want you to understand that submission is very important to the Lord. Most Christians don't think rebellion is any big deal. I mean, we resist authority. We don't give it a second thought. You know, it's just so, much, so many of us 
are just characterized by rebellion. Well, let me ask you this. How would you respond if you found out that a Christian friend of yours was involved in witchcraft or idolatry? Would it concern you? Would you talk to them about it? Look what the Scripture says in 1 Samuel 15, 23. Rebellion is as the sin of divination and presumption as iniquity and idolatry. So it's saying you, you rebel. When you're rebelling, it's like divination. Why do you think submission is so hard for us? It's a one-word answer. It begins with a P. Pride. Pride. <laughs> what was the first sin in the garden? I think it was pride. The temptation of the serpent came with these words, you'll be like God. The temptation, te temptation to be like God, I think, is greater than we think. We all face it. And we resist being subject to law. We squirm when we're placed under too much authority because we love to be free. Free from restraints. Free from accountability. Our quest to be like God is a quest to be above law. It's a quest for autonomy. Autonomy means literally self-law. So a person who seeks to be utterly autonomous is a person who seeks to be a law to himself. He's answerable to no one. 1 Peter 5.5 5 says, Likewise, you who are younger, be subject to the elders. Clothe yourself with humility toward one another. And watch what he said. Here's why. Why? Because God opposes the proud and gives grace to the humble. So, if you want to be proud, guess who's opposing you? God. That's not a good place to be at all. By nature, though, folks, we're all rebels. Our pride causes us to rebel against authority. We don't want anyone telling us what to do, especially someone who's not as smart as we are, which is everybody. <laughs> but I want you to see, this is what's really important that we understand this as believers. Submission is a mark of a spirit-controlled believer. Look at Ephesians 5, 18 through 21. Do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit. The word filled here is plerao, it means to be controlled by. So you're not to be controlled by alcohol. We know that controls people. Whenever people do really dumb things, it's because they're controlled by alcohol. But be controlled by the Spirit, he says. Then he goes on to say, addressing one another in psalms and hymns, a spiritual song, singing and making melody in your heart, giving thanks always. That's a spirit-controlled, spirit-filled believer. They're thankful. Giving thanks always for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Yeshua the Christ, submitting to one another in the reverence of Christ. Submission, people, is a mark of a spirit-controlled believer. So in order to overcome pride, which causes rebellion, we need to be controlled by the Spirit. Now the question is, how are we controlled by the Spirit? What do we need to do? I believe the answer is in a parallel passage in Colossians 3, where he says this, let the Word of Christ dwell in you richly. Instead of saying, be filled with the Spirit, he says, let the Word of Christ dwell in you. And then the results that follow are the same as the passage from Ephesians. Teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom. Singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. There again, we have thanksgiving in your heart to God. Whatever you do in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Yeshua, giving thanks to God the Father through Him. Wives, submit to your husbands as is fitting in the Lord. So if we compare these two texts, we have be filled with the Spirit, and then we see submission. Colossians, let the Word of Christ dwell in you, and then we have submission again. The results are the same in both passages. So I think it's safe to say that to be controlled with the Spirit, we have to have the Word of Christ dwelling within us. Again, people, this is why it's so important that we spend time in the Word of God. It's hard for God to control somebody, to steer somebody, when they have no reference point. As we spend time in the Word of God, the Spirit uses the Word of God to control us, to move us. As we study the Word of God and submit to the teaching, we're empowered by the Spirit. We're controlled by the Spirit. Rebellion, people is a serious sin against God because all power is ordained by God and we're to submit to it. When I think of submission, especially to the area of church leaders, I think of Bob. I used to call him Budget Bob. But I'll never forget when Bob first came to the church and the attitude that he had about submission. He was truly a spirit-controlled man. The first time he visited the church, he went around and he spoke to all the pastors. And the next week, 
he came back to the church again, and he invited Kathy and I over for dinner. And I'm not going to turn down the dinner, so I said, yeah, absolutely, I'll be there. And he said, I need you to bring two things. And I'm like, okay, what do you need? He said, a doctrinal statement and a financial statement. And I'm like, okay. So we went over, we had dinner, and then we jumped into looking at both those statements. We spent the whole evening going through question and answer over those statements, basically with a fine-tooth comb. I remember we left that night, and Kathy was like, you know, kind of, wow, that was, a, that was a grilling session. She goes, you think they'll be back? And I was like, absolutely. I said, first of all, they'll be hard-pressed to find another church that will give them a financial statement. <laughs> I mean, that's just the truth. You know, you're not going to get that from most people, all right? The church I worked at, I wasn't even allowed to look at the finances, which tells you something's not right there, okay? So, <laughs> several weeks later, they put in their application to join the church. And he told me that he was so thorough because he realized that when he joined the church, he was putting himself under the authority of the elders and he wanted to make sure he could submit to them. And see, I do this in marriage counseling also. I talk to the wife and say, is this a man that you can submit to for the rest of your life? Because that's what marriage is doing. That's what you are doing. So you need to make sure you can do that. Well, Bob, he was a student at Regent University at the time and they had a Wednesday night class at Regent that he wanted to go to, but we had church on Wednesday, so he came to the elders and he asked for permission to miss Wednesday night services so he could go to that class. See, Bob understood the principle of authority and submission better than anyone I've ever seen. I mean, it's rare that anybody asks for a doctrinal statement and wants to go over it with you. He's the only person I've ever had asked for a financial statement, want to look at what we're doing with our money. He wanted to give and he wanted to make sure I, can, I want to submit when I'm here. That's what it means to him. King David was full aware that all authority came from God and therefore he was submissive to it also. In 1 Samuel 24, David is hiding in a cave and guess who comes in the cave? Saul comes in to use the bathroom in the cave. And David is hiding in there, and his men say, oh, look at it, it's great, we go kill him now. God has provided him. David had already been anointed king, but he still viewed Saul as authority. Saul was a sinful man, but David continued to see him as the Lord's anointed, and David didn't kill him. And I pray that the Spirit of God would instruct us from the examples in the Word of God, and may we have the heart of David, a spirit of submission, to authority. Now, when I'm in a store and I see a door with a sign that reads employees only, I don't go in there. Why? I'm not an employee. It's not about breaking a law. I don't enter because the governing authority of that store said, that's not for me. That's for other people. And if I don't like the laws or the rules in that store, guess what I can do? Go to another store. Okay? but it doesn't give me the right to break those laws. I'm called to obey and not resist authority of the store owner, just as I'm called to obey the rules of my neighbor when I'm on his property or at his house. We're to obey those who govern our various situations, whether it be neighbor on his property, security guard at the mall, shopkeeper in the store. Christians make the best citizens because they strive to live in submission to authority. The godfather of communism George Hegel, argues that government is divinely sanctioned to do anything it pleases and that God requires people to submit regardless of natural standards of justice. And that argument has been used by virtually every tyrant since the first century, including Adolf Hitler. And they all point to Romans 13. See, you got to do it. Here's what Romans 13 says. And that's why I think it's important that we understand Romans 13 because it's not calling us to submit to all civil authorities. And the question we have to ask is, are there limits to submission? That's a question. Okay, thank you. Someone's awake. Sure there are. We're never to violate Scripture to submit to anyone, no matter what they say. Look at Acts 5, 28 and 29. Saying, we strictly charge you not to teach in this name. They're telling the disciples, you quit teaching that. Yet here you have filled Jerusalem with your teaching. 
<laughs> That's pretty cool. And you intend to bring this man's blood upon us. But Peter and the apostles answered, we must obey God rather than men. People, that's, you know, God is the highest authority. We have to obey Him. And when the earthly authorities conflict with that, we always go with God. As Christians, no earthly authority, no earthly law can exceed the Word of God. When the two clash, God wins. And when the governing authority extends its reach beyond its defined role, I believe that it's become the enemy of God. This is true whether the ruler is a king or a group of neighbors acting as a local faction that's a democracy. It's even true when the ruler is the owner of the store or your neighbor in his backyard. So there are limits to authority. A father has authority in his home, but it doesn't give him the power to abuse his wife and children. An employer has authority on the job, but it doesn't give him the power to control the private lives of his employees. Although, many try to do that. A pastor has authority as overseer in the church that doesn't give him the power to tell employees in the church how to run their businesses. Believe me, I've been in churches where the pastor is telling people who they can be friends with in the church. This is exceeding, far exceeding. Okay, but again, we go, people, they'll run to Romans 13. See, you've got to do what I say. Romans 13 says, I'm the authority. Listen, all human authority is limited. No man has unlimited authority over the lives of other men. Now, we in the United States of America do not live under a monarchy. We have no king. There's no single governing official of this country. As Americans, here's the question of our message, who must we submit to? The supreme law of our land is who or what? Okay, does anybody even know what this is? called the Constitution of the United States. This is the ruling, governing document that this country was founded under and to live under. And listen, under our laws, every governing official publicly promises to submit to the Constitution of the United States. The Constitution was adopted on September 17, 1787, by the Constitutional Convention in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. It was ratified by conventions in 11 states and went into effect on March 4, 1789. The first 10 constitutional amendments ratified by three-fourths of the states in 1791 are known as the Bill of Rights. The Constitution has been amended how many more times since then? 17. There are 27 amendments right now to the Constitution. That guides the American society. That is our law. That is how we are to live, okay? Under our laws and the form of government, it is the duty of every elected official to obey the U.S. Constitution and his or her state constitution. Now, the problem in America today is that our political leaders have violated their oaths of office and they ignore, they blatantly disobey the supreme law of the land. That discludes them from authority. They're they're stepping out. They're they're going against what they should be supporting. Our government is loading us with unlawful laws. We have so many laws today. You know, Christians think, okay, well, Romans 13, we have to obey every, every law that there is, okay? Or we're sinning then let me tell you something, you sin every day. Because you don't even know what all the laws are. They make up new ones constantly. Okay? from If your seatbelt's not buckled, you're sinning. If it's raining out, and you don't have your headlights on, you're sinning. Your wiper's on, your light's got to be. I mean, just rules, rules, rules all over the place. Alright? I don't believe we have to submit to these laws because so many of them are unconstitutional. And we have to make decisions there, I understand that. But we do have brains, and I think, you know, if we know the Constitution, let me share with you Amendment 1. Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion, or prohibiting the free exercise thereof, or abridging the freedom of speech, or the press, or the right of the people peaceably to assemble and to petition the government, for a redress of grievances. Okay, so in America, you can burn the American flag, 
as an act of free speech. Right? And I agree with that. That is free speech. You can do that. But do you know that if you burn the, great, the gay pride flag, you go to jail for hate speech? How is burning one flag hate and the other flag's not hate? What is burning the American flag? Love speech? That's hate speech, isn't it? And if that's, you have that right, why don't you have the right to do something else? Because our government is lining up behind this LGBTQ community and everything they want done, they, you know, we've got to put that in effect. When a baker can get sued because he won't bake a gay cake, there's something wrong there, people. It's his business. He should be able to turn down anyone he wants to. It's his business. Go somewhere else. But you know, they traveled over 100 miles to go to that bakery because they were targeting him. Amendment 2. A well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. So is this giving us a right? It's saying we have a right. It's saying they're not to infringe that right. Okay? In 2008, the Supreme Court ruled 5-4 to four that U.S. citizens have a constitutional right to keep a loaded handgun at home for self-defense. Now, I'm glad they put loaded there because people are such morons today that, you know, they, I mean, an unloaded gun is just pretty much a heavy weight, a paperweight or something. You know, you could hit them on the head with it maybe, you know, but I mean, that's so dumb. But that, they had to make sure they put all those words in there. A loaded hand got it home for self-defense. And this right is under attack right now in Virginia. All right? Our governor is making all kinds of threats. He wants to disarm Virginia. And as Democrats prepare to take power this month, the governor vows it's a new day and a new landscape in Virginia, he says. He says, when Democrats take over the state legislature for the first time in a generation at the start of the new year, passing gun violence prevention laws will be a top priority. Let me say this, he's a moron. And the reason I say that is because if you just look at statistics, the higher, the more gun laws people have, the higher the crime rate. Guess what? Criminals don't obey laws. You go to states with the most lenient laws, the, cr the crime rate is very, very low. Why? Because <laughs> everybody's packing and they'll shoot you if you try to do something stupid, all right? Virginia governor is supporting SB 16 which would ban commonly owned firearms in more than one million Virginia households. He will make gun owners criminals overnight. And it's a ban that would even outlaw sporting weapons such as a Mossberg 930 snow goose gun. So it's not just, you know, and listen, they, they coined this term assault rifle. It's a, just a rifle. It doesn't assault anybody, okay? Any right, anything you use, a stick, a gun, a, a whatever, to if you assault somebody, then you're assaulting with that. But, you know, if it has a flash suppress suppressor on it, then it's an assault rif rifle. It has a, a trigger, it has a handle for where the trigger, it's an assault rifle. It's a bayonet, it's an assault rifle. In other words, just about every rifle that's out there is going to be an assault rifle. The governor has requested $4 million and 18 law enforcement positions to enforce his gun ban. To enforce a gun ban. A request that could be preparatory steps for confiscating the guns, which will be banned in SB 16. He's threatened to bring in the National Guard to enforce this. And let me just say that, you know, if you work for the National Guard and you're going to try to enforce this, you better kiss your wife and kids goodbye before you go out to try to enforce it. Because Americans are not going to hand over their guns. Virginians are not going to hand over their guns. Okay? This is a constitutional right. This is a right that we have that the Constitution supports. Moreover, the governor is requesting another $3.5 million to enforce gun control that has not been passed by the legislator and is not even current in Virginia. Universal background checks, one gun a month. Where do you get you can only buy one gun a month? 
so-called red flag gun confiscation orders. You know what that red flag's all about? Your neighbor doesn't like you? Hey, my neighbor has guns. Then they come and confiscate your gun. It's crazy. Let me tell you what I think about this. I think it's treason on behalf of the governor. It's treason. Virginia law, the Second Amendment, it, that same almost identical wording is part of the Virginia Constitution. That Virginians have the right to keep and bear arms. And when he, when our governor went into office, he vowed to support the Constitution of the United States. Virginia Form 49-1 is a form of a general oath required by officers, says this, every person before entering upon the discharge of any function as an officer of this commonwealth shall take and subscribe the following oath. So here's the oath our governor took. I do solemnly swear or affirm that I will support the Constitution of the United States and the Constitution of the Commonwealth of Virginia, and that I will faithfully and impartially discharge all the duties incumbent upon me as governor according to the best of my ability, so help me God. And I believe that if they pass these gun-restricting registrations, it's unconstitutional. And I don't think as Christians we have to go all the way, let's turn our guns in. And many Christians will be promoting this when it happens. They'll be saying, well, Romans 13, we've got to submit to the government. Turn your guns in. Let, let me say this. Mass killing of civilians by military dictatorships in the 1900s were more often than not preceded by the confiscation of firearms from targeted populations. A task made much easier by laws requiring registration and licensing of private-owned firearms. An unarmed population are slaves. There's nothing you can do. You just submit, you just do, go with whatever, okay? Joseph Story, who was a constitutional scholar and Supreme Court justice, said this. One of the ordinary models Mode, one of the ordinary modes by which tyrants accomplish their purpose without resistance is by disarming the people and making it a fence to keep arms. People just think about it. I mean, if the government's going to, you know, try to enslave us, push communism down our throat, they've got to disarm us. You know, America, <laughs> I've read this several times. I don't know how true it is, but a lot of people keep repeating it. The largest standing army in the world is the American hunter. The largest army in the world. And you know when the Japanese were attacking us, they were afraid because they were like, everyone's got a gun over there. Okay? And that, you know, that is cause to fear. Okay? Because most ordinary citizens are not going to sit in their house and shut the door. They're going to grab their gun and they're going to go out and they're going to get involved. All right, let's look at this text. Therefore, whoever resists the authorities resists what God has appointed, and those who resist will incur judgment. Now, those who apply these verses to civil government say that we need to obey every law our government passes or we're sinning against God. Well, first of all, I don't believe these verses are talking about civil government. I don't think Paul is telling believers to be subject to the Roman government. If he was doing that, Rome wouldn't have put him to death. Paul said, hey, you all be subject to Rome, and they killed him. Wait, he's a good spokesman for us. Let him stay out there and keep on preaching that stuff, right? In the Roman world, Caesar was Lord, and he had the power of death, and threats to Rome were mercilessly crushed. Everyone in the Roman world knew that the cross had clear symbolic meaning. It meant that Caesar ruled the world with cruel death as his ultimate and regular weapon. The problem from the standpoint of the Roman rule is that they used this against Yeshua, but he didn't stay dead. Okay, the power of Rome is the cross, and the power of God is the resurrection. So he just shut down Rome right away, all right? God raised him from the dead. He made him Lord. Rome says that Caesar was Lord, but it was truly Christ that was Lord. He says, rulers are not a terror to good conduct. How many of you think that fits civil authority? Well, if they're civil authority, they're, they're, not, they're not a terror to good conduct. Is this true of our government? If we do what is good, will our government praise us? How many of you ever heard of Dr. Brzezinski? Stanley Brzezinski is a biochemist and a physician. 
He's a founder and president and chairman of Brzezinski Research Institute based out of Houston in Stanford, Texas. They have taken Brzezinski to court. They have raided his office, taken all his files, done, I mean, over and over again. Why? Because he helps heal people from cancer. You think, well, wait a minute. Rulers are not a terror for good conduct. Isn't helping heal people, wouldn't that be classified as good conduct? Why do they hate him? Because our government is ruled by the pharmaceutical industry who pays them to make sure that they get top notch, okay? And the only thing our country that is legal in our country is cut, poison, and burn, okay? Any other all treatment is wrong. And they don't want that because it, it's cutting into their finances. The Gershon Clinic operates in Mexico because our government won't allow them to heal. You know what they use to heal? This is why the government probably put them out. They use vegetable juice. Juicing, that's the primary thing of the Gershon Institute. Okay, juicing. So, wait a minute. You know, we can't have people telling people they need to drink vegetable juice. That's not good. So the government constantly hounds them. I don't know how many different, you know, holistic doctors have been killed or left the country because our government, you know, big pharma rules. All right? They got a lot of money and they pay Congress. And so these are a bunch of paid servants in there taking the money that they tax us. You know, if you grow a certain kind of plant, the government will arrest you and put you in jail. A plant. Our government says that what God created is evil and you can't use it. And yet our government pushes drugs that cause all kinds of adverse effects. But to use something that God created that doesn't cause it, oh no, we can't have that. We don't make money on that. So you can't grow marijuana. Okay. Pharmaceutical company makes sure we can't do that. But here's, one, here's how dumb our government is. Here's how stupid our government is. Hemp is illegal. You can't get high. I don't care how much hemp you smoke, eat, do whatever. You'll never get high off hemp. Okay? It's illegal. Why? DuPont. DuPont bought off Congress that we got to make this illegal because they can't. It's competing with them. Listen, you can take hemp and make anything you want. And, and a hemp crop from start to finish, 90 days. Way better for making paper because you don't need all those chemicals to make it. In 90 days. Trees take how long? So we don't have to have any kind of common sense involved in this at all. These lawmakers make these laws. How do, I don't know how they can do it. Is it because we're so dumb they just think, well, they don't figure this out? Or they don't care? Hemp's illegal. Now, states are starting to turn this around, and, and they're legalizing hemp, and they're bringing it back in. And man, it's going to make a huge difference because it's a marvelous product. You can make anything out of it, from clothes to concrete to whatever, all right? Verse 4 and 5 says, For he is God's servant for your good. But if you do wrong, be afraid. He does not bear the sword in vain. For he is the servant of God, an avenger who carries God's wrath on the wrongdoer. Therefore... One must be in subjection, not only to avoid God's wrath, but also for the sake of conscience. It seems to me that our government brings wrath on anyone that disagrees with its practices. Like I said, many holistic doctors have been killed. It's just amazing, you know? They did, you disagree with their practices, they'll kill you in violation of the First Amendment. I don't think Paul's talking about government in these verses, people. Not at all. Verse 6. For because of this, you also pay taxes, for the authorities are ministers of God attending to the very thing. And ah, Christians, you need to pay your taxes, okay? Because, yeah, that's, God says to do that. Let me ask you a question. Are actions which are sinful for individuals, such as theft, murder, kidnapping, also sinful for those who call themselves government? Should be. Is it wrong for government to take from some person what belongs to them and give it to other persons to whom it doesn't belong? What will we call that? Theft? 
Is it wrong for the government to benefit one citizen at the expense of another by doing what the citizen himself cannot do without committing a crime? We go to jail for these things, but government can do them. Take the parable of the Good Samaritan. He sees someone in need, and he reaches into his own pocket. We don't know how much money this guy had, but he reached in his own pocket, and he helped the needy at great sacrifice to himself, maybe. He didn't rob the next passerby to support the victim of the first robbery. Well, let me help you out, buddy. Hang on. I've got to find someone coming along. I'll rob them and give you some money to help you. When a government-dependent person sees a needy person, he doesn't take personal responsibility and act at great sacrifice. He looks to the government who robs the next passerby, taxation, pockets half the money, and hires someone to give the rest to the needy. One act of violence is compounded by another. People, the state engages in more theft, murder, and kidnapping than any other group of people, including criminals, from which the state promises to protect us. The state is without close competition the, uh, the greatest theft and mass murder on the earth. No doubt. Now someone might say, well, isn't it constitutional that we pay income tax? Well, the federal government rests its authority to collect taxes on the 16th Amendment to the Constitution. The federal income tax, which was allegedly ratified in 1913, says this, the Congress shall have power to lay and collect taxes on income from whatever source derived without appointment among the several states, and without regard to any census or enumeration. Now, after an extensive year-long nationwide research project, William J. Benson discovered that the 16th Amendment was never ratified by the requisite three-fourths of the states, and nevertheless, it was put into practice, all right, by Knox. It was fraudulently declared ratified. The 16th Amendment never received enough votes from the states to be ratified. Therefore, it's not actually a legal amendment. Now, I know of some people who have fought this and won. Don't count on you winning, okay? This has been ruled on and decided by the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court, the highest court in the land that cannot be appealed against, said the 16th Amendment gives the government no new powers of taxation. Verse 7, pay to all what is owed them, taxes to whom taxes are due, revenue to whom revenue is, respect to whom respect is owed, honor to whom honor is owed. This is what we're to do. Pay to all that is owed them. Now, I don't think I would get much resistance when I say that our country is a mess. The state has way overstepped its bounds. And we're putting, being put into bondage to all kinds of rules and regulation that are being imposed upon us. When I picked up Gennady from, he flew here from the Ukraine, Jeff and I picked him up in, at the airport in D.C. We're riding back. We probably weren't even a half hour into our trip. And Gennady says, looks to me and he goes, are, are all your roads like this? And I'm like, yeah, pretty much. Why? And he goes, and you don't like your government? <laughs> and I said, it's all a matter of perspective. You know, I mean, their government's a little wilder over there than ours, but I mean, there's not much our government doesn't get away with that it wants to do. And so, yeah, I, I oppose these governing officials who are literally robbing people, literally murdering people. But here's the thing, people. If you are not happy with the state of our government, as I am not happy with it, Blame the church. I believe that the state of our nation is a judgment from God for the sinfulness of the church. Let me give you a quote from the Biblical Horizons newsletter, number 20, entitled, Who Rules the Land? by James B. Jordan. Jordan says, The message of the Noahic Covenant is this. Right now, the church rules the nations of the world. We and we alone have been given power and dominion, and if we don't like the way things are going, we have only ourselves to blame. Unbelieving rulers are puppets, and we are the puppet masters. They dance to our tune and move as we pull the strings. They rule only as we direct them, 
Right now, they are doing exactly what the church has told them to do. This is the true reality. It is the way things really are. But because of sin, we in common with all men suppress the true reality and believe a myth. We believe that those who wield external power are the rulers of this world, but that simply is not the case. It's interesting to read Romans 13, 1-7 in light of the Noahic Covenant as we have understood it. Paul says that every civil authority is established by God. And I disagree with Jordan on this, of course, but he says that the Roman Caesar is a cause of fear for evil behavior. He says that if the church does good, the ruler will praise her. He implies that if the church does wickedly, the ruler will persecute her. Christians are to pay taxes to their slave rulers so that the slaves will be able to do what Christians tell them to do. What does this mean? It means that when the church is faithful, God will convert the heart of the ruler and he will rule righteously. All right. Conversely, when the ruler is evil and destructive, this means that the church has not been pleasing to God. The church is always in charge of culture, and she has been in charge ever since the flood. We don't have to take the world and culture over. We already have them. We have to start using them aright. This is not something new that comes in with the new covenant, though the new covenant puts it into force as never before. When Joseph was faithful... Pharaoh converted. We understand that, right? He did what God called him to do. He was righteous and God promoted him. When Daniel was faithful, Nebuchadnezzar converted. It was because Judah was wicked that Nebuchadnezzar conquered her. The picture of the world throughout the Old Testament is that Jerusalem is the center of the world and that the faithfulness of or faithlessness of God's priestly nation determines the fate of the whole world. The New Testament presents the same picture, making the world's fate rest in the hands of the church. What are you saying, and I agree with them, is when the church is faithful, God changes men. We cannot reform the state as an action separate from reforming the church. If the church is faithful, God will bless her and there will be good rulers. But look at the American church today. It's putting on shows. We've got lights, we've got smoke machines, we've got all, you know, and it's pushing health, wealth, not pushing the gospel, not teaching the Bible. It's a joke. In the largest church in the country, the American pastor is Joel Osteen. And we wonder why the country is such a mess. The church is to set a standard. Notice what Yahweh says to Judah through Nehemiah. I think this text is very pertinent to us today. Nehemiah 9, 35-37. Even in their own kingdom, and amid your great goodness that you gave them, and in the large and rich land that you set before them, they did not serve you or turn from their wicked works. Behold, we are slaves this day in the land that you gave our fathers to enjoy its fruits and its good gifts. Behold, we are slaves. They didn't serve, they didn't turn from their wickedness. So therefore, God says you're slaves. And watch this. And its rich yield goes to the kings whom you have set over us because of our sins. They rule over our bodies and over our livestock as they please, and we are in great distress. People, this could be said of America. Behold, we're slaves today in this land that you gave our fathers to enjoy its fruits and its good gifts. Behold, we're slaves in it. Its rich yield goes to the king. You know how much we're taxed today? You got employment tax. You buy a car, there's tax on that, sales tax on that. Then they're going to charge you property, personal property tax. Not only did you have to pay tax because you bought the car, you have to pay tax because you own the car. Then you want to put gas in it, you've got to pay tax for that. On and on and on it goes. And it's the rich yield of this land goes to the kings. Millionaires. How many congressmen, congresswomen are millionaires? 
They want, ta they want Trump's tax records. Who cares about his tax records? He's a billionaire who came into politics. I would be more concerned with a politician that's a billionaire, became a billionaire in politics. How'd they get all that money? I think the rulers that we have today are a result of the sin of Yahweh's people. A weak church is not the victim of an evil society. An evil society is the victim of a weak church. And we're not going to fix this country through an election. We're going to fix it through the church honoring Yahweh through righteousness. When Christians begin to live out righteousness and holiness in the faith of, faith of this world, and they see a difference. When the church calls people to repent, calls these rulers to be righteous and godly. People, we need, if you're not like the situation we're in, we need to work to reform the church, not the government. We need to set the standard. And when the church is as messed up as it is in this country, we can understand why the government is so messed up. Just go back and read through your old covenant. Whenever Israel submitted to God and praised God and put God first, God blessed them, put them in their land, had all they needed, Whenever they disobeyed, he would remove them from their land. He would put rulers over them that would oppress them. That's what that text in Nehemiah says. The rich yield of their land goes to those who are set over us. Why? Because of our sins. We need to work to reform the church. Let's pray. Father, I thank you this morning for your word, Lord. Father, this text in Romans I know is a difficult text and I know so many people use it to support the idea that we need to bow to civil government. I truly don't think that's what this text says, but I ask your people, Lord, in my hearing, to be Bereans. Don't believe what I just said, but search this out and see if it is true. I think it comes to the point where our governor threatens to take our guns. That is unconstitutional. That is treason against the Constitution of the United States. Give us wisdom, Lord, as your people, who may honor you by the lives we live. Amen. Okay. Questions, comments? learning together because that's where you had to go but you know in Jerusalem you would be kicked out of the synagogue so I'm assuming there's a different attitude toward um, Jews and Gentiles that were Christians in the synagogue I mean that it was okay for them to worship together yeah they basically like I said had to worship together but it never it was always conflict and I think that's why he's telling the Gentiles you guys need to stop trying to stir up trouble here and love these rulers and demonstrate the love of Christ to them because we want to win them, not condemn them and not cause fights. And like I said, the context is just so, I don't know, you got love, love, and civil government. I'm like, well, <laughs> why? How does that connect? It's like it's just randomly, and that's why some people say, Paul didn't write this, it got stuck in there later. Well, what about the deal about bearing the sword for nothing? Would the Jews... Again, okay, yeah, her question, Sharon's question is, what about bearing the sword? All right. Again, I didn't go into all the details of that, but if you go back, if you go on the website, in our Romans 13, I got two messages on, I think they're called authority and submission. The second message, I went through, exegeted these texts and applied them to the synagogue. And I think you'll see that, you know, if you go listen to that, the words that are used there, the phrases, they are connected with the synagogue. They're not connected with civil authority. All right, it'll become much clearer. I almost debated doing two of these, and no, I didn't want to do that. I just wanted to just throw this out, just because my purpose here is basically political to say, listen, if the law comes to it and says they're going to grab your guns, I don't think it's your biblical duty to surrender them. The law of the land is the Constitution. Yes, civil disobedience.
I don't know. Someone wrote in there. The question was, do you pack? <laughs> oh, do, oh, I get it now. Do you pack in the church? Um, <laughs> all right. Let me, let me say this. Um, we are not a soft target. Okay? We have a plan in place. I have a 45 in the pulpit. Several, three other men have guns, all right, in this church. So, yeah, we're not a soft target. Lord, hope we'd never have to shoot anybody, but we're not going to sit around like fish in a barrel and be shot at. So, yeah, that's... I, I hope you're not asking because you plan on coming here and causing trouble. <laughs> so, if that's... You got your answer anyway. <laughs> yes, if you come, come prepared. Gary. You touched on it earlier, and I think it's a bigger problem, but you mentioned the verse in Samuel about um, divination. Yes. And you also said presumption, and I think presumption is probably a bigger slippery rock for all of us because we presume this is a small sin, and it's not going to have that much effect. And we tend to presume too much often, always. And there's no, not going to be any ill effects or any side effects or bad effects. Presumption is just real easy to shove under the carpet or whatever. You know, the way I approach this starting out with submission, I think submission is very important, okay? I think it is. I think, you know, it's a sign of a spirit-controlled believer. But again, we're not submitting to every rule and ordinance there is out there. We just can't do that. And again, as, as, a, as a country, as an American, the rule of law is the Constitution. And when they violate it, they're the criminals. <laughs> they can't criminalize us for not keeping all their little rules when they themselves are violating the oath of office that they've taken. So we need to find an honest lawyer mm -hmm. to defend us. Stan? Uh, two things. Uh, can your governor be recalled? Um, I don't know if the government can be recalled or not. I mean, like I said, I, I consider what he's doing treason. Right. Well, he's violating your constitution. He's a violating the constitution. But see, the, the problem here is they will argue the wording, okay? And they want to say, you know, this doesn't apply to us today. You know, this was back then. No, the whole reason for the Second Amendment is to protect us from government. That's the protection. Government run roughshod over its people if they have no protection. We can protect ourselves. Again, the largest standing army in the world. And people who know how to use their guns. Okay? Well, that's the thing, but people don't, you know, let's face it, in our government today, common sense is gone, okay? I mean, they, again, the, the whole gun argument, just look at when people are armed, there's no crime. And that's the Supreme Court's job, to interpret the Constitution. Not to write new laws, not to come up with ideas. They're to interpret that. And they did. And they came out and said every American has the right to keep a loaded firearm. Yeah. But they're also starting gun parts. So, you know, if you don't necessarily have that gun part, if your gun is capable of accepting a particular gun part, then that gun is illegal. Well, they're also targeting ammunition. Right. You know, like states like New Jersey. You can't have a hollow point in New Jersey. You know, I drive through New Jersey, and man, I'm like driving the speed limit, doing perfect, and I don't want to get stopped going through here, you know, or through Maryland, or when I go through Maryland. I go through Maryland for about two miles, and man, I'll tell you, I'm like right on the speed limit, you know, because I do not want to get pulled over because I'd be a criminal in Maryland, all right? And you know, Trump has proposed, President Trump has proposed that, you know, if you have a license in Virginia, you can drive in any state. He says the same thing should be true for concealed weapons permits. If you have a concealed weapons permit in Virginia, it should be good anywhere in the United States. And I agree with them. I mean, a lot of states have reciprocity with Virginia, but a lot of them don't now. 
And so, you know, you drive across state lines, and now the laws are all different. What do you do, you know? Somebody pointed out that what you said about the American hunter being the largest army. Standing the army, yep. They're also, 98% of them are all snipers, too. They got scopes and things. Well, that's what I mean. The American hunter, they're well-trained. Okay, they know how to hit the target. Like you said, many of them are snipers. I mean, we got d bird duck hunters who can hit something that's moving. You know, we got, you know, squirrel and rabbit hunters who can hit these little tiny targets. You know, these guys are not just, you know, Joe Average that bought a gun, never used it. They use them constantly and they know how to use them. And I, I just think that, you know, our government is very foolish if they think that Virginians are just going to lay down and say, okay, whatever, take our guns. We'll, here they are, give them up. First of all, they cost a lot of money. You know? Secondly, when we do that, we're in huge trouble. Yeah, yeah. Plus, I did pay taxes on my guns. The second part was, and I've heard this somewhere, but there's like 25 million evangelical Christians. They don't even, they're not even registered to vote. Well, that's probably true. A lot of Christians are registered to vote. A lot of people, you know. Gary? question I don't want to ask is, I'm at home and the sheriff shows up, police show up to take my guns. I start shooting the law. Well, again, this is something that, you know, we're going to have to decide, you know, if this gets to that place in Virginia, because, you know, what do we do? I can't, I just, so many law enforcement people are making it clear that we are not going to enforce this, you know. We're not going to do that. We're not going to go against the American people and try to take their firearms. Uh, it, I don't know what's going to happen, you know, uh, who knows, but I just, you know, again, I want it to be clear that I don't want you to think because the government says you have to give up your guns that you should do that. A lot, a majority of counties and cities in Virginia have now voted yeah. to declare a second amendment. Yeah. yeah. Uh, how many is it, 95 now? Okay. Okay. Yeah, 90 of the counties in Virginia, Chesapeake being one of them, has adopted to be a Second Amendment sanctuary city or county. Meaning, we're, you know, you put your laws wherever you want, they're not going to come here, okay? We're not abiding by those laws. And that's when the governor threatened, I'll enforce it, I'll use the National Guard to enforce it. Well, right. Well, <laughs> well, I don't know. Something has to happen. And like I said, I think it's, you know, let's, let's work on reforming the church. Let's work on being the people God's called us to be, and God will bless us with a government that uh, honors Him and uh, puts Him first.